Lisa from Mobile Tech Review, and this is the new Surface laptop from Microsoft. You know, everybody said, okay, you've made a tablet, you've made an almost completely laptop-like tablet, also with the Surface Book, you've even made a Surface Studio desktop. Where's the laptop, the most popular form factor in the world for computing still to this day? So finally, Microsoft has done it, and it's this, the Surface laptop with the rug on top, the Alcantara top, available in your choice of that cobalt blue, burgundy. This is your titanium finish, which is close to silver. And then there's a graphite gold, which is kind of like a subdued gold. So it's unusual looking, certainly. It is very pretty. It's head turning. Nobody's going to mistake this for any other laptop because that's a pretty distinctive thing to do. It's the same finish they use on the Surface Pro type cover signature edition as well. So now that you've asked Microsoft to make a laptop and they've done it, what's the, going to be the problem here? And I'll tell you, you don't even have to watch the whole video, honestly, is that as always, Microsoft prices these things high because they don't want to put their OEMs out of business. They make their money off of Windows licenses to Dell, to Asus, to HP, to all of those companies. When they originally started making devices like the first Surface and Surface Pro, it was just to kind of show them how it should be done. Because Windows 8 came out with touchscreen and all that kind of thing, and there was not much in the way of touchscreen hardware. A couple of very expensive things and not a lot of innovation. So Microsoft said, screw it, we're going to do it ourselves. We're going to make stuff that even our OEMs might want to copy. And that's cool if they do. And of course they did with the Surface Pro line, right? So with Surface Laptop, they're pricing it high, even I would say higher, relatively speaking, for what you get than the other products that they make because they really don't want to tread on Dell, HP, Asus, Acer, anybody's toes here. So it's clearly not going to compete in as much as you might think, even with the Dell XPS 13, which suddenly seems kind of affordable for what you get inside. We're gonna look at it now. So here it is, a piece of aluminum unibody goodness. It is relatively thin and light for a 13 inch class Ultrabook. That is 14.5 millimeters thick and around 2.8 pounds. Now the Core i5 and the Core i7 weigh slightly different. So I'm averaging it out. It's around 2.8 pounds, which is about 1.25 kilograms, I believe. So it's portable. And 13.5 inches is nice, just slightly larger than the usual 13.3 inch, but it has that three by two aspect ratio that Microsoft always uses, which is kind of nice. So things aren't as short height wise on the screen. You, you don't have the, the widescreen aspect ratio. So it's useful for things like web browsing, seeing more of a document on screen, that sort of thing, but you will get the usual letterboxing if you're watching 16 by nine content, that's not so bad. Just like the Surface Pro 4, the Surface Book, we have a theme going on here. You have that same mini display port, one USB 3.0 port headphone jack. And it uses the same kind of connector, the magnetic charging connector, as the other Surface portable products. And, you know, when you're looking at a tablet like the Surface Pro, you say, okay, it's a little tablet, I get it. There's not a lot of room for the ports. Okay, they make a nice dock. It's $199, but it gives you display ports, USB ports, Ethernet, all that kind of thing if I need that. But when you're talking about a laptop these days, that's pretty stingy on ports. Of course, the fact that there's no USB-C in Thunderbolt 3 is also a disappointment, despite the fact that Microsoft swears they asked people and nobody wanted it. Well, ha. Huh. So that hurts a little bit too, especially if we compare it to something like, aha, uh -huh, the Dell XPS 13 here in... Uh, Gold, 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 isn't it? So a really nice laptop, and suddenly it starts to seem a bit affordable. We'll talk about the pricing there, but you've got more ports even on the Dell, and the Dell is not even the most portalicious machine out there. At least you have two USB 3.0 ports and an SD card slot on this little guy who has a very small footprint, is available with some lovely high-resolution displays, and all those things that the service is going to offer. So the Surface laptop starts at the same price when you're working on the Core i5 models. There's no Core M for the Surface laptop. Same price as our Surface Pro here. $999 gets you a not real beefy configuration. Four gigs of RAM, a 256, uh, 128 gig SSD, excuse me, Core i5 processor, Intel 7th generation, KB Lake, dual core, 15 watt, right there. Ultrabook through and through, Intel HD 620 graphics. You can get it with a Core i7 and then you get Intel Iris 640 graphics. So if you want to move up to the more desirable model, the sweet spot, just like the Surface Pro, it's $1,300, $1,299. You still get a Core i5, but then you have eight gigs of RAM and a 256 gig SSD. I think that's the one most people will be interested in. And you can go up to $1,599 and higher if you want those Core i7 configurations. So it's more expensive than even the, the Surface Pro 4 without really throwing in a whole lot more. But 
Compared to the very expensive Surface Book, which starts around $1,500, well, this is more affordable. Then again, the Surface Book starts with a Core i5, 8 gigs of RAM, and a 256 gig SSD, around $1,500 these days. You know, there's some deals and prices, and you're getting a higher resolution display there, detachable design, some neat things going on. So, yeah. As a value proposition, like I said, the Dell XPS is looking good. Lenovo certainly has some nice convertibles like the Yoga 910 and the 720 series that are going to be price competitive, have metal casings, backlit keyboards, all the creature comforts here. What you're paying for is that Microsoft support. If you find that a good thing, that depends. Some people have good experiences, some don't. Usually the Microsoft store people are pretty cool though. And you're getting something that's really well made and you're getting a unique look with the Alcantara keyboard deck, which has some people worried because they're worried about the durability on this. And it's wipeable with a damp cloth. You can clean it up. Obviously, it's not going to withstand gouges and it might eventually discolor a little bit, though, as a longtime Surface Pro user, my keyboards have not gone icky. So I'm not hugely worried about it. It really depends on what you're going to be doing. If you have a plumbing business and you take this with you, assuredly this is going to get nasty looking, but office worker, probably okay. The keyboard itself feels a lot like the Surface Pro 4 type cover, only you know, more rigid because you have a normal conventional design here. And that's a good thing because it's an excellent keyboard. Also, obviously a little bit more spacing here and also similar to the Surface Book. It's a very good keyboard. It's very pleasant. And there's a couple of creature com comforts and intelligent things here. Like the power key is on the keyboard, but instead of putting it where the, the delete key usually is here, they've moved it one in. So if you have that muscle memory where you're reaching for delete and you keep putting your laptop to sleep, it's not going to happen here. So that's pretty nice. Also nice is we have the single touch FN key that lights up so you know that it's doing it by default. You have multimedia controls up here, but one touch of the FN and you're doing F1, F2, F3 for those times when you need it. The trackpad is pretty good. Microsoft Precision Trackpad. Microsoft does good trackpads in general. You can probably even hear that. It's a, it's a pretty loud click. That's the only thing. People are going to notice you in the library if you're clicking away on this thing. But hey, it does have a touch screen, 10 point or multi-touch, so you don't actually even have to use the trackpad if you want to avoid the clicky sound. It also supports the Microsoft Surface Pen. Of course, we have the newest generation here, but that is of, I think, limited use because this is just a laptop. So it's not the most ergonomic thing. You're not going to be drawing on this, obviously. Even note taking is awkward, and this is as far as it bends back. So, no no pen in the box, and I, I don't think a lot of people are going to be running to use the pen here. Could be wrong, but I would certainly prefer a Surface Book or a Surface Pro instead if I wanted to use the pen a lot. Now, one thing to keep in mind when I'm talking about price parity between this and the commensurate Surface Pro models is that the keyboard is not included with the Surface Pro, so you have to throw in another $130 to $160 for that Surface Pro. Pro, if you want to you know, have a keyboard that like, comes built in with this, they can't sell this one to you separately, can they? Those of you who are real enthusiasts and have actually watched iFixit's teardown of this know that they, they essentially call this the glue book. Uh, there's, every other laptop in the world, there's some screws in the bottom and you unscrew it and you have access to the internals. Usually at least the SSD is upgradable and you can access the battery. Heck, even a MacBook Pro, you can remove the bottom from it and you can access well, these days they're soldering the SSD onto the motherboard, but you can access the battery. You can get in there on other machines. Not so with this one. This is this is unibody, this whole edge here. It's all one piece, which is beautiful to look at, but it's a nightmare to service. If you need to get this service, you're definitely going to be sending this into Microsoft because what you have to do is basically pry this Alcantara off and then there's an aluminum underframe underneath it and you're going to destroy it in the process so this is not something that you're going to upgrade later on uh, and if you need a service you're going to have to have microsoft do it for you obviously so get the ram get the ssd capacity that you need or if that doesn't sound appealing to you obviously there are competing laptops you can consider instead so like the surface book it is a 13.5 inch display again with that three by two aspect ratio which i really like a lot and it's a very good display in terms of color gamut. It comes pretty well calibrated, calibrated from the factory to a little tweaking and that's about it. But it's lower resolution. It's 2256 by 1504 pixels. I don't know how they come up with these numbers, right? Surface Book in comparison is 3000 by 2000 pixels and even Surface Pro is higher resolution. So that's 201 PPI instead of the usual around 267 PPI that you get say on a Surface Pro. And 
Obviously, service book's going to be higher resolution as well. Still, that's plenty of pixels. This, it, I'm, not, I'm not seeing individual pixels when I look at the screen. It is covered in Gorilla Glass 3 for an element of durability, though. You know, I don't worry about laptop screens so much. It's non-convertibles, non-tablet kind of designs, but it's a peace of mind, I suppose. And it's a glossy screen, but it's not overly reflective at all. Microsoft does a very good job of controlling reflections. It's pretty bright. It measured 340.8 nits according to our colorimeter. Now, there's no access to the Intel graphics driver with this for Intel power management settings. And once again, we have power management for dummies, just like we had on the Surface Pro that I just reviewed, which pretty much just gives you a slider saying more battery life or more performance. And that's about it. So uh, there seems to be, even once you disable auto brightness in the charm settings, as some behind the scenes adjustment of brightness going on. So Take that with a grain of salt. It might be a little bit brighter than that. It covers sRGB spectrum completely in 80% of Adobe RGB, so it actually beat out our Surface Book and Surface Pro. Pretty nice. Gamma, white point, black levels, all good. Contrast there, not as good as the Surface Book and the Surface Pro 4 and 1080 to 1, but still, it's good. Another important thing to consider is the fact that this high-end laptop ships with that new Windows 10 S. Now, Windows 10 S acts, looks, and feels just like regular Windows 10 Home or Pro, but you can't install EXE applications, desktop programs. That means Photoshop, CC, uh, Premiere, you know, all the desktop programs. Only stuff from the Windows App Store. So forward-looking, things are looking good for that App Store. Like in a year or so, Microsoft showed off a lot of programs like Adobe programs being available on the App Store, but they aren't now. So you have through the whole of 2017 to upgrade to for free to Windows 10 Pro. You just do it through the App Store and it takes about five minutes, that's all. But what happens in 2018 if you buy one? I don't know. And a Windows 10S just isn't really the, an ideal match for this kind of high-end laptop. In terms of performance, it performs like any other Intel KB Lake dual core CPU Ultrabook on the market. It scored a little bit under the Surface Pro that we have, which has a Core i5, 8 gigs of RAM, and 256 gig SSD, and that's a Core i5. 5-7300U. Um, it's a good performer and heat was not an issue. It gets warm. It doesn't get burning hot. The fan's very quiet too. I, again, they, they've done a phenomenal job with cooling Microsoft stuff. There are some things to really like here too. You know, I've been giving it a, a hard time because it's a bit expensive for what you're getting, but there's the, the cool running, good performance kind of thing. A very lovely display on here, a pleasing keyboard. There's a lot to be said for it as well. And cosmetically, of course, it's very nice. Battery life, Microsoft claims 14.5 hours, and if that was true, my God, I'd say buy two of them. But they're exaggerating. Are they, you're, you're using a, a scenario that most people really don't encounter, which is playing a local video on the SSD with brightness set really low. And, you know, these CPUs are really well optimized for video playback, so that's not really going to make them break a sweat if it's a 1080p video. So in real world use, and a mix of productivity work, doing some Photoshop too, a couple of heavier things like that, doing a little bit of web work in Dreamweaver, you get the idea. With brightness set to 40%, which is perfectly adequate, I've been averaging around eight hours, which is, again, much like Surface Book. So that's quite good. And like Surface Book, it has a 45 watt battery, and it also ships with the same charger. It's 44 watt charger, and it looks just like the last gen Surface Pro 4 charger, which will also work with this. So the voltage is a little higher on the newer one. So there it is, the Surface laptop. It's styling. It's really well put together. It has a zero repairability index because you have to destroy your rug top over here and pull the aluminum off that's underneath the rug top just to get to the stuff. You're never going to upgrade this. You get the idea. What you will get is something that's very well made. If you happen to live near a Microsoft store, you've got their equivalent of a genius bar you can walk into to get help, uh, get the unit swapped, all that sort of thing. So those are creature comforts. And it's, it's one of the nicest looking laptops out there, I would say, too. And it's a decent machine, certainly. It's very quiet. The battery life is pretty strong on it. It's just certainly not the best deal by far in town. I'm Lisa from Mobile Tech Review. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more cool tech videos. And thumbs up if you like this vid.